Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy in a closet in Charleston. And this is Beth in a closet in Charleston. Oh, Hi. and we have a friend with us, another friend, Kelly. Oh, hey, um, I'm Kelly. And these two are lying to you because we're literally sitting at the kitchen table in Charleston. <laughs> oh my God, you blew our spot up, Kelly. <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Full disclosure. Hey, <laughs> Good morning. Yes, we are in Charleston together. We are recording fine at a kitchen table together. <laughs> but we're together. So it doesn't matter. Right? We don't need to be in closet. No. We're hiding in here. Yeah, we are. And we have had a fantastic weekend. We've done a lot of things. We have hung out with our friend Stevie. Stevie. Holler. Like, huge, huge fan. We made malas with Stevie. Yes, we did. At Grit models? and Grace Studio dot Go <laughs> <laughs> we'll check them out. Check them out. Check their website out. They have some fantastic jewelry, and and Christy bought all of it. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So there is none left. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. This is a great, great weekend so far. We've um, malas. We have toured downtown. We've walked City Market. Oh, we did. Yes. I forgot about that. We smelled horses and all the things that come with that. Uh huh. And we did a ghost tour. We did. We dragged Kelly yeah. to a ghost tour with Bruce, it the was awesome. tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't tell by her voice. It actually wasn't. It was a real bust. And that's such a shame because we were so here for it. Yeah. It was... Mm. It was disappointing. His stories dragged on and on and on and on, kind of like us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not really. <laughs> yes. But his are not true. No. I mean, well. Well, well I mean, I want to believe they're true. Not his. <laughs> okay. Right. Anyway. And we went to Fig. If you're yes. not in Charleston or from Charleston or have ever been to Charleston, you got to put it on your list. Mm -hmm. And what was the place we went to today? Daps. Daps? Daps. Daps. D-A-P-S. That's a must. It is a local kind of place that serves brunch, and it was delicious. And we spent hours there playing cards and drinking mimosas. <laughs> yes. So if you're in Charleston, those are your must-dos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have a great Airbnb you can stay at. So there you go. Yeah. Anyways, other than that, anybody got anything else? Because we can drop. Just no. Thanks for letting me crash your party. I was just gonna say, Thank Kelly, you, you, should, you should come filter in here and like tell the people your story. Um, I, I my story is I love these girls and I'm glad <laughs> to be on Girls Weekend with them. <laughs> Kelly lives in Saint Pete, Florida, <laughs> yes. and she met Christy while Christy lived there. Yes, we and taught, taught together. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we do girls trips. Yeah, yeah. Second annual. Well, yeah, was it a second kind of? We know. can't count COVID. Yeah, COVID doesn't the, count for anybody. Well, not. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Because our yes. first one was Nashville. Yeah. And we went to the Carrie Underwood concert. And then COVID yes. hit. And now this is the second one. Yep. So so where's next year? Oh, tell them. Oh, yeah. This is, Christy oh. has a terrible idea, guys. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you guys should weigh in on this. <laughs> Subscribe below. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, is that not how this works? Okay. I can this. <laughs> My idea, which I got from another friend of mine who actually is using this service right now, is I can't remember the name of the company, but you go online and you sign up and you answer all these questions and they plan the entire trip for you and you don't know where you're going until the day you leave. And I don't know why anybody doesn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> and Kelly and I are like, mm, nah. <laughs> we don't know why anybody would do that. I don't like surprises, but I, but I will do it. I think it would be an interesting concept. Like, I would like if we could narrow it down, like have some idea, like warm weather place. I think that they or... would let you know what to pack for. Well, yeah, yeah. they'd have to, but, but Come also on. what if your flight's at like six o'clock in the morning and they tell you at four 30, like, no, well, maybe in that case, they would have to tell you the night before, like, or the day before. Right. I just need to, I need it's to read 20, their rules. It's probably a 24 hour in advance. Okay. Like we will give you 24 hours. If you okay. Notice, two Has days. anyone done this? I have a friend who Not signed up recently. Someone who listens. Does your friend listen? Hi friend that listens if you do. Sorry. She's no, she probably doesn't. Okay. Well, if <laughs> anyone who listens has done this, please call me. Yes. I can't remember what it's called. Like pack and go or something like that. Hmm. I mean, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
just I don't hate it. You answer a lot of questions, so I feel if like- it's a cruise, I'm out. Oh, I'm no. I'm it in. says travel by plane or train, uh-uh. drive or it says also staycation. You can choose. Oh well, wait. So you, oh, you, so like in your area, right? So you okay, can. You, okay. they, they ask a lot of questions. If you check the website out, there's a lot of questions that they ask. Okay. So. Well, I'll I'll answer the questions. Okay. That's that's you right. have me at that. Okay. okay. We'll <laughs> I will commit to that. That's all right. My idea. Come up with another one. <laughs> <laughs> like literally there's so many places we could go. Yeah, I mean like like right now cuz I can name like eight. <laughs> right now. Fine. Fine. Okay. I'll go myself. Just stay tuned. Stay we'll take tuned. you with this. Kelly will come on next yeah, wherever in. wherever we are. Yeah, wherever we are, Kelly will be in the next intro. There you go. Yeah. yeah. We'll see you in one year. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, are you guys ready to jump into some crime then? I think so. Well, here we go. So we have a suggestion (laughs) that I am shocked. (laughs) Um, This is actually from your friend in France, Sarah Michelle. Oh, yes, my friend. She's an old friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. She speaks like all kinds of languages. Well, I was going to say, I was writing with her about this at one point and like the stuff like she said that she was an interpreter for the court system mm-hmm. in North Carolina, Georgia and Georgia. Yep. And whatever. And I was like, well, oh, that's really cool. But also like awful that you have to just like listen to all of this awfulness. <laughs> yeah. All the time. She's and very <laughs> good at what she does. She is a suit. So, she's so smart. Yeah. Well, this one is it's definitely an awesome, awesome, not awesome. It's not awesome. This case sucks. Sorry, I told her it's rough for me. You'll you'll know why, um, but definitely needs just needs to be out there. Like it needs to be it needs to be told. Okay, so I'm glad that I'm glad that she suggested it. So. Okay, um, it's a cold case that was solved 34 years later. Oh man, 34 years. Okay, well, there's a spoiler, but anyway, it's the case of Timothy Coggins. Okay. I didn't know the name. I was actually surprised I didn't know the name, but nope. Anyways. So we are headed back to Georgia oh, for this case. Mm-hmm. Georgia, Georgia, on my mind. Oh, yeah, so Georgia. Getting up there. It is. We've actually said that recently on an episode. Like, I think it's one getting to be one of the <laughs> ones that we talk about the most. Hell yeah. Um, we are going to Spalding County, which is a rural farming county about 40 miles south of Atlanta. Okay. Um, it's where the town of Griffin is, and Griffin is the largest city in Spalding. And in within this town, there's definitely sides of the tracks, like black side, white side. Yikes. Okay. At, well, at least at the town time of this case. Okay. There was. Um, it takes place in 1983, and... During this time in Griffin, there is still a local clan chapter. That no rallies and parades at in 1983. Oh, well, still. Yeah, right. I just wanted to make sure that I was not like you weren't hearing that right now. Okay, <laughs> I definitely heard it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. So no, they still are holding rallies and parades during the time of this case, which is in 1983, and that. But even. Whatever. I don't, I have no idea what it's like now. I'm assuming based on interviews of people that live there on the 2020 episode I watched, which was aired back in like 2016 or 17 around then, um, there's still issues there. They they said it's not like great, but mm-hmm. we, we know that there's still issues in a lot of places. Okay. So um, I'm hoping that the Klan's not there anymore though. Oh my gosh. Because either way, 83... 63 any freaking time this is just sickening to me it's gross clan oh my gosh i'm not gonna like this case no 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 you won't (laughs) so okay timothy was born august 29th 1960 he was one of eight children between his mom and stepdad so i don't know the makeup of that but i know that there was like it was a large family between the two of them 
His siblings said that Tim had a big smile. He was charismatic, outgoing, and caring. He loved to dance and would always walk his younger family members home to make sure they got sta- home safe. So, like, he wouldn't let them. Love just- that. Yes. Tim was also known to be friends with everyone, black or white, which in Griffin at that time definitely got him noticed. Hmm. People, you know, would see that and some would not take a liking to that at all. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. His family and friends even said that they warned him about making friends with the white people. Like, wow, watch out for that. Yeah. On the night of October 9th, 1983, 23-year-old Tim went out to the local dance club called People's Choice Club. (laughs) That's cute. (laughs) Yeah, that's cute. Tim was out on the dance floor as usual, and on this night, he was dancing with a white woman. Talisa, which is his sister, was at the club with him that night. She just assumed he was teaching this girl some dance moves. And mind you, this was a predominantly black – I think it was pretty much an all-black dance club, so she kind of stuck out Okay, in, in this place. Um, Talisa walked to the bathroom and as she was going, she overheard some people saying, he's looking for Tim. And as she was coming back out of the bathroom, she could see Tim walking out the door following like a couple of white guys. By the time she gets out the door, Tim and these guys are nowhere to be found. So a couple of days go by and no one has seen or heard from Tim, but apparently this is not unusual for him. Like, Maybe on the weekends he would you know, end up like couch surfing and just like hanging out and partying with friends and whatever. So sure. It wasn't unusual for him to like not check in. I mean, he's 23. I was just getting ready to say he's, man- he's a man. Yeah. So nobody really thought anything about up <clears throat> of it at the time. Two days after, which is the same time frame, like I just said, he, nobody heard from him for two days. So it, it, in that same time frame, a group of hunters found a body. And the police started walking around with a picture of this person asking to help identify the victim. And clearly, this, I mean, not clearly, but he was, this person was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable. So they couldn't like determine who it was and hardly anybody else could. Um, So they come across Tim's sisters at one point and they walk up to them and show them the picture just randomly, like, because they're doing this around town. And one of the sisters recognized a tattoo on the arm of the victim as one that Tim had. So that is awful. Yes. Can you imagine awful. just somebody walking up to you and then you being like, oh my God, that's my brother? Right. Yeah. No, I can't even imagine. And I believe that Tal- Talisa was not the sister who identified. She was there, I believe. And when it happened, like she saw, she saw it. But she couldn't believe it. But she, in her head, she kind of knew all along he probably was dead based on, like, the fact that these people were looking for him. She saw him leave, and then they didn't see him anymore. But Oh, my gosh. So this was kind of confirming what she felt deep down but was kind of denying to herself. So the family had to have a closed coffin c- ceremony because of how badly beaten he was. They didn't want him to be seen. He had been stabbed over 30 times. In the chest and in the back, he had an X carved in his chest and back. Later, it was said that that represented the X on the Confederate flag. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Gross. He he had also been chained to the back of a truck and dragged up and down the road. Oh, a few my times. God. Yeah. Freaking awful. And then left to die because it didn't, <gasps> all of that did not kill him. He basically bled to death. Left to die under a large oak tree that some people refer to as the hanging tree. I'm sick. Yeah. Well, girl, let me tell you. I, I was sick researching this. I literally was watching some 2020 on my computer and I had my headphones in and my husband was like, why are you watching? Like, usually you watch a case, you know, on the TV or whatever. And I was like, well, because if any of the kids come, I do not want them hearing this. Like this, this is not something I want them to even know that I'm looking at. I mean, I'm not saying I'm like sheltering them from the fact that things happen, but they don't need to like hear all these details. No, so I don't need to either. Oh my gosh. No. So this was um, he. This spot that he was found was located in Sunnyside, which was a poor white part of the county. 
And this was the most horrific murder that this area had seen, I believe, at this time. Or I, murder, yes, but it. I mean, let's call it what it is. It was a lynching. This is just gross, disgusting. A hundred percent. I yeah, hope makes me sick they the stomach. rioted. What happened? Oh, brought the brought tears to my eyes several times. I think I texted you, like, yeah. oh, oh my gosh, I'm was I'm I've cried three times watching this 2020. Okay, so police investigated this for two weeks. And then it just stopped. And two months later, the case was closed with no answers. Wow. The, hello, Lynn and Lacey. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If you haven't listened to that, it's one of our first episodes we did. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Wasn't that in Georgia, too? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I per- yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So the family figured that the police just considered him another black dead black man and it didn't matter to them what whether it was solved or not and they probably and, did yeah no what, what, you, this is a pretty much an obvious fact at this point when you hear what happened oh no um and there were actually like people from the community like the black community that would actually like um set up their own search teams because the police just weren't doing their job but anyway like not like search teams looking for him but like trying to find the answers because clearly they had already found him Okay, so soon after the murder, the family also started receiving multiple threats. Tim's stepdad, who was a bus driver, got in his bus one morning, and there was just a bloody white T-shirt in there. They call the police, and police take it, and then they never hear another word about it. Nothing. One of the sisters remembers the phone ringing one night and someone saying to their father, you look into the faces of the people who killed Tim every day. Leave the investigation alone. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Another time they're sitting watching TV and something comes smashing through the window and it was a brick with a note attached that says, you're next. This is like a movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. This, yeah, for real. Uh huh. The things these people are living through. My Uh God. Oh wait, here's one last one that you're, there could be more, but. Another time, there was a decapitated dog left in the hallway of their home. So not only are they doing these awful things, but they're, like, entering their home to, like, leave things. Like and that. harming an animal. Like, well, these are yeah. sick people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. They are. For years and years, this case was cold, stuck in a storage area somewhere. And at one point, the GBI, which we all know and love the GBI, um, they go through cold cases, I guess, and rotate through them every six months. And so in December of 2016, I will say we will like the GBI this time. Oh. (laughs) So um, an investigator came across Tim's case. He was shocked by what he found in the file. In the file, there were two men that were mentioned in connection to this case. It's unclear as to how their names got brought up, but they were in the file. Um, but basically they were interviewed or at least one was interviewed. And then like four, four days later, it's never mentioned in any of the notes of the two week investigation that they did. And then the other one was never interviewed at all, but his name is brought up, but he's never even brought it. Hmm. Yeah. So these men are Frankie Gebhardt and Bill Moore Sr., They were brother-in-laws. Bill was married to Frankie's sister. Okay. And at the time of the murder, Gebhardt had an alibi, but it was clear in the file that the alibi had some, like, holes in it. So it wasn't, you know, foolproof or whatever. Okay. (sighs) Gebhardt and Moore were also somewhat known as, like, troublemakers at the time. And in one article, I feel like somebody said something about them being frequent flyers in the court system. So Hmm. they're they're not good people. They had a reputation for violence. Gebhardt had dropped out of school in sixth grade. Hmm. So not very educated. (coughs) Excuse me. Sorry. And he's just kind of trying to get by. Like he's just, you know, he has a sixth grade education. So what can this man really truly be doing in life? But the investigators had also discovered that most of the physical evidence that had been in this file was lost over the years. There were 
there were at one point soil samples, tire tracks, DNA from the body, hair that was on the body, and a wooden club that was suspected to be used to beat him, and also an empty Jack Daniels bottle that was found near the bottle body, and all of these things were missing. Oh <clears> my <throat> gosh. Wow. You could have found so much. Fingerprints, DNA. <laughs> yeah. So all that was left was a pair of jeans, which I think were the ones that Tim was wearing, a rock that was suspected to have been used, and a sheet that was used to cover the body at the time. Around the same time as the, invest as the investigation was being reopened, a new sheriff had been elected. He had been a police officer years prior to this, and he was aware of the um, mistrust that the black community had with the police in this area and was like kind of wanting to repair it. He's a white man <clears throat> and he just wanted to try and get this, this relationship back on track. But we all know that that can take years and years and years. Like it's not something that's going to be fixed mm -hmm. probably anytime soon. So he comes across a notebook that a former police officer who had been on the force around the time of the murder had kind of left. I don't know where this guy was. I'm sure he was retired by the time, by this time, maybe even not alive anymore, but he somehow finds this in the, um, in the station, the police station. Within the year prior to the murder, this police officer wrote in this journal and he had written several entries that suggested there were police that were also members of the Klan, including this man, that was writing the notes. Well, that does not surprise me at all. No, but it's gross. It's very often law enforcement and like prominent <sighs> political members. And I mean, it just is. <sighs> this makes me want to vomit. <laughs> Sorry if you hear my children, they're home today. Uh, he had written about um, a meeting that members that were attending and getting sworn in on, sworn into the clan, including himself. And this may have also been another reason that this case went nowhere back in the day, because they clearly, if most of these guys on the force were a part of the clan, they didn't care that this black guy was dead. I mean, we already knew that was the case, but really, these truly, they truly did not care. So when their names got brought up, Frank, or when they found their, their names in the file, Frank was in custody on an unrelated sexual assault charge at the time that they reopened this case. So they go to speak to him in jail in April of 2017. They showed him pictures of Tim and asked him about the murder. His response was, I ain't never seen that pic <gasps> picture. I ain't never seen that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't say the word that he said. Also in April of 2017, another inmate had sent a note to the GBI stating that they had information and wanted someone to come and talk to them about this case. This man was Christopher Vaughn, who had been in jail for child molestation, I believe. So he's not a good person. At the time of Tim's murder, Christopher was 10 years old, and he was with the group of hunters that found Tim's body. Okay. So he was aware of the situation. He had also seen Gebhardt and Tim together at times, all that. So... When he asked them to come talk to them, he did attempt to get his sentences, like, not reduced, but, well, I guess, yes, it would be reduced, because he was serving consecutive sentences, and he was asking for them to make him concurrent, so he wouldn't have to be in there. But when I heard the interview, well, a piece of the interview, the GBI was like, we can't promise that, like, so either talk to us or don't, like, right. give that. So he was not promised anything, giving this information. He said that while he was in jail, Frank, he had come across Frank, had admitted to the murder to him multiple times, almost as if he was proud of it, still like 34 years later. Oh, I believe it. I believe it. Once you got a dark soul, that does not come, it doesn't go away. No, no. Oh, and this man is terrible. He also said that Frank mentioned throwing the weapon down the well behind his house. Also, other convicted people were coming forward and saying the same thing at different times. So he is in jail telling more than one person. They started questioning others again. And as soon as investigators spoke to one resident of the trailer park, 
um, that Frank lived in, as soon as they got there, this man goes, Frank Gebhardt killed that boy. Like that was like, they show up, they say why they're there. And he was like, well, Frank Gebhardt killed that boy. Could, couldn't you have told us that back in the eighties? He did. He said, Frank admitted it to him one day within like a week or so of the, the murder. He went to this guy and I don't know if he was part of the, um, hunters, I'm assuming because of the way the conversation went, but he said, I heard you found that boy by the tree. I put him there. And the man said, I reported it to the police within a week and no one cared. So he did step forward. Th this is so gross. Oh, it's disgusting. So now they're digging for people in this guy's past. They find an ex-girlfriend who told them that she was afraid of him. Like he was super controlling. And when they fought, he would tell her, if you don't stop, Wait, if you don't stop, then you'll wind up like that mm, in the ditch. So how do he's mentioning people even just walk around talking like this. Like what in the heck I know. is happening in Georgia? I know. Yeah. Well, it's ridiculous. Not just Georgia. But you know what I'm saying. No, I know. I know what you're saying. A man whose mother dated Frank at one time says he remembers Bill and Frank talking about it one night. They were drunk and said, oh, the old days when we used to kill black people for no reason. Oh my gosh. Girl, I'm telling you, like the this person is beyond despicable to me. Both of them. A man, nope, I already said that. They started to listen to his phone calls in the prison, and he had calls from his sister where she tells him not to talk to them. Don't talk to them. Don't give them anything, meaning the police. Don't agree to nothing. Don't agree to no tests. Don't take drinks from them. Don't give them DNA. <laughs> like she's basically like, Okay, keep, keep keep yourself clean. Like now that they're talking to you and asking you about this, keep yourself clean. And he tells her he's just been telling them he knows nothing about the murder. So then they also question Bill, who's not in prison. He says the same thing, though, that he doesn't remember ever hearing about the murder and that he knows nothing about it, which these are statements are really weird because this was the talk of the town. Like mm -hmm. when this happened – it was a horrific, and they had not seen anything like it before. And so for them to claim that they had not even heard of it, that's just – I mean, unless you've got amnesia or, like, Alzheimer's or something. <laughs> right. No. There's no way they never heard of it. So the manager of the trailer park at the time that this happened that Frank and Bill lived in says she remembers one night Frank, Bill, and Frank's sister, Sandra, I believe – Um. They were out drinking in the trailer park. Frank and Bill leave, and she went up to help Sandra get inside and into bed. Mm -hmm. And she was blubbering, saying, he's going to kill him. He's going to tie him up and drag him with the truck. <gasps> and at the time, she was just like, oh, go to bed. Go to bed. You're, you're drunk. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. Who you're talking about? Like, just go to bed. So, But she remembers this being said. All these people had said that Frank was mad about Tim sleeping with his old lady. Oh. Frank had been, yeah, yeah, <laughs> old lady. It's a good term, right? Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, Frank, not the worst thing he said, sadly. No, it's not. Frank had been in a relationship of sorts with a woman who was also sleeping with Tim. She was white and Tim was black, so this was not okay to Frank. Also that it was his old lady. It's also assumed that the woman Tim was dancing with in the club was this woman. Okay. And I believe her name was Ruth. But she moved out of Griffin two weeks after the murder, and she died in 2010. So they could not find her to question her now at this point, unfortunately. Hmm. So this seems to corro corroborate this theory, though, that she – like, if Frank did kill this guy and – she knew about it. She's so upset that this happened. She leaves town and she's like, I'm, I'm out of here. Cause I'm oh sure she was gosh. afraid of Frank at that time too. No doubt. So it's believed that Frank and Bill were those white men looking for Tim in the club that night and that Tim left with them. And then they brutally beat and murdered him. Brutally. Brutally. Beyond brutally. If there's, a, yeah, if there is that, it stated that Frank had admitted to this killing at least 17 different times throughout his lifetime. Oh my God. With all the people that they had talked to. Investigators arrest both Bill and Frank. Apparently, there is also a press conference announcing that they're going to arrest him or these guys. 
And they're like, this is what time we'll be at the station if anybody wants to come and see these guys. Essentially, they were like putting them out there on blast. Like, I don't I'm hate that. Take these. I don't hate that either. So Bill gets brought in, but Frank, who's already in the jail and in pinstripes and all, gets taken out the back door and walked around to the front of the building where all of the press is <laughs> to be like rearrested. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, GBI. Here's a point for you. Yeah, point for you. And this really, I think it was this new sheriff that was in town. Okay, he was the one that uh, had that press conference. But yes, GBI clearly was in cahoots with them. So, okay, but here lies the problem. Oh no! Practically, well, don't worry. Practically, all of their witnesses are convicted felons. I mean, it's everybody in the jail. They're child molesters. They're this. So they're like, okay, we need evidence. We need. Like more than just the word of all of these convicted felons. So, which they don't have because everything went missing. Well, not everything, but most everything went missing. Right. So they have to start digging for more. They would love to excavate that the well. well that I was just going to say said. that. But apparently it's so close to the trailer that if they would do that, it would destroy the whole trailer and they can't. They can't do that because people are living in it. I think his mom. Well, I don't know if his mom's still living in it because she's probably dead. But they can't destroy the trailer. So they have to figure something else else out. So they find a hydrovac company in Atlanta to do the job. Do you, have you ever heard of that? No, but I mean, I think it sounds pretty self-explanatory and I'm so here for it. Yeah. So basically what they do is blast water into the well and then they have this huge vacuum that sucks out all of the contents of the well into okay. like a big tank. So they commissioned this company to do it. And this would obviously destroy a lot of the evidence because they're blasting a ton of water in there. However, they're like, well, we need to take the chance because basically that's all destroyed anyway. Everything's been sitting in a well for 34 years. It's already not, you know, like going to have a whole lot of DNA or any DNA on it anyways. But if we could find something that links him, if we can find the knife, if we can find something in there, then at least we'd have that. Yeah. Like what would the odds be that there would be a knife in there? Except right, exactly to corroborate the story, right? So, when they empty the tank, do you got any guesses as to what they find? Do they find a knife? Oh yes, they found a knife. It was broken, like pieces of it, but there was a knife. There was also one Adidas sneaker, which matches the description of what Tim would have worn, and he was barefoot when they found him. They find a chain that is believed to be the chain that. They tied him to the truck too. They find a t-shirt like the one that Tim wore that night. And when they lay the t-shirt out, it has seven <gasps> holes across the back of it. And in the autopsy, it states that he was stabbed seven times in the back. Booyah. There you go. There you freaking go. See you later, Frank. Frank, you monster. And Bill. They now believe they can take it to trial. So in June of 2018, a jury unanimously convicts Frank of malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, and concealing the death of another. He was sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. Mm -hmm. Despite his lawyer's best efforts to discredit all of the felons and the witnesses and also to try to discredit all the evidence because they, they requested it be tested, but they never tested it because they were like, we're not going to find anything. We know we're not going to find anything. Right. It's just the fact that we have it pr is proof enough. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So Bill, he decided to forego a trial. He's like, I don't want to go through it. I don't want to put my family through it. He... I I mean, I'm not saying he was a good person, but I feel like maybe he turned his life around a little bit better than Frank did mm -hmm. after this. Not that that changes anything that he did, no. but I don't think he wanted his family to – he was just like, yep, fine. I will agree to plead guilty to voluntary manslaughter and concealing the death of another, and he gets 20 years plus 10 years probation after that. Maybe he's actually sorry. Well, it is possible, but – I don't know. I feel like I write, write this somewhere. I think he's remorseful. I can't say that he's remorseful that he did it or remorseful that he got caught. And now right. his family knows what he did. Right. And that's what he's most upset about. Well, that's not yeah. remorse. Then. <laughs> yeah. That's selfish. Yeah, exactly. But I don't know. That's just my, it would be my theory. Anyway, 
Frank's sister, Sandra, his nephew, Lamar, who was a police officer, and a man named Greg Huffman, who was a corrections officer, are all charged with obstruction because of passing information to Frank on how to avoid the DNA testing. I have not found anything about if they were like went to trial or anything. I, I wasn't able to like find further information, but they were being charged with all that. Wow. Yeah. So after 34 years, this family finally has answers and a conviction. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Tim's mother died 10 months before all of this happened. Oh. But apparently when a family member was visiting her, she all of a sudden announced, she was like laying in bed and she was like, they know what happened to Tim. They know who killed him. They're going to figure it out. And that's all she said. And then it was like 10 months later. I mean, she passes away. And then 10 months later, that's what exactly what happens. Mama knows. She does. Thank goodness. Tim, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Tim's family is very religious. Actually, a lot of people in this town are, including that sheriff that basically – made all of this happen. I mean, and the GBI. They all believe that he provides for you and that he can make anything happen. This also means they are quite possibly the most forgiving people that I have ever, ever read about. I can't say that I ever met because I haven't met him. Maybe I will one day. Would love to. I want to give him a hug. They have footage of the family talking before on this 2020. You should, this is what I was crying about too. Um, before they go to trial, and I believe it's Tim's niece that's speaking and what she says, gosh, she says something along the lines of, we're going to court tomorrow. We're going to hear a lot of information and we need to not react. Their families are going through something just like our family is going to. And we need to just not react to it so that they can be respectful. Seriously? Like, I'm sorry. Me. I'd be like, mm-hmm. Yeah, and be like, oh, probably wanting to like nudge it in their faces, but it's true. Like his, their families now, or at least Bill's family now, like they didn't know anything about this. Then it's not their fault. So it's so amazing how sympathetic they're being towards his family. Yeah, showing not them, him. They're showing the family grace. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm not even done. Bill's daughter. Bill has a daughter named Brandy, and the entire time she cannot believe that her dad would do anything like this. She's convinced they picked him and just pit to pin it on him because he was friends with Frank or whatever, and that they would do anything to nail him, no matter what. She talks about how she's scared to go anywhere or do anything because she thinks police will use it like any excuse to put her in jail. And during the trial, she's a witness. She's probably a character witness of some sort and is instructed to stay outside the courtroom because she cannot hear what is happening. But at some point, she gets called back in and the judge holds her in contempt because the bailiff had caught her watching the live stream in the hallway. And so they do put her in jail. So she's oh. kind of like, see, told you. Like, they're just after us for some reason. Hmm. So anyway, whatever. But her dad's the one that takes the plea deal. And he pretty much admits. And like I said, shows a bit of remorse. And I think, like I said before, it's more because like now Brandy knows what he's done and whatever. So after the trial, because all Brandy has seen is like a loving dad, as far as she's concerned. Sure. You know, so. Hopefully. I mean, good. I'm glad well, for her. But I mean, yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, I have seen like um, in this 2020, it shows kind of like bits and pieces of like family home videos and stuff. And he just seems like a normal, like loving grandpa and whatever. So anyway. So after the trial and both sentence hearings, Brandy comes up to Tim's family and they have this all on footage because I'm sure that like they were like following them when all this was happening and going down because this was like at the time, this footage. She goes up to them and she tells them that she's so sorry that this happened to their family and she's like crying her eyes out. And because also I'm sure she said that her dad's going to prison too. And Tim's niece, the same one who's like, don't react in the courtroom, whatever, once again, swoops in, hugs her, and tells her it's okay. They don't blame her and that they lost someone 34 years ago, but now she's dealing with a loss as well because she's losing the dad that she thought she knew as a good dad and a good grandfather and that they are sorry for her loss as well. And I mean, when I tell you, I'm like uh, amazed by this family's 
ability to be, as you said, grace, like giving her grace, like yeah. giving the family grace. Oh, that's like the most empathic thing I've ever heard. Uh, and then about five to six of Tim's like family members, sisters, whatever, nieces, whatever, come around her and like basically like are hugging her as she's sobbing outside the courthouse. Totally validating so, her like victimization as well. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. The amount of compassion and forgiveness that this family is able to show just amazes me. They are five-star award-winning people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can only wish that I would be that kind of person. Yeah. In any situation. I, I, I Clearly, I would never want to be in their position, but I can't say, I can say that if it was me, I would be that way. And I'm, yeah. and I'm like a, you know, believer in God too. <laughs> so, you know, but I feel like, oh, uh, I, like this case angered me so much. I think I would have been like, yes, in the courthouse. Right. So anyway, anyways, that's it. That's the case of Timothy Coggins. And thankfully it is the murderers have been brought to justice. Yeah. After 34 years. You know what too makes me so sad is like, if you think about how great his family is, like he 100% was like that too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, just by the way they were describing him. And as, they yeah. literally said that they would kill black people for no reason. Which, I mean, I know we feel like they had some type of a motive because of the old lady or whatever. But, like, yeah, that's not a reason. No. So, it was for no reason just because they are sick. Sick, awful people. And it always makes me sad when sick, awful people win. Over, you know what I mean? Like, went free yep. for 34 years, victimized more people. The one guy, Frank. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, terrible human being. That's a terrible, terrible case. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad got solved. And I'll tell you what, Timothy, rest in peace. Your legacy lives on through your amazing family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I have learned a lesson today in grace and forgiveness. So mm -hmm. that is for you, Tim. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for covering that. Thanks for the suggestion, Sarah Michelle mm -hmm. from France. Mm -hmm. Yes. Whew. We've I know. some places today. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I'm less like I'm just like speechless now. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. She got it out and now we're tired. <laughs> it's like <sighs> Yes. The crash after the adrenaline. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I I am sorry that you had to cover this case because I know for sure this was way harder on you than it is on me. And it was pretty hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for telling his story and his family's story and his legacy. And we hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And stay tuned also at the end of this episode because the suggestor, Sarah Michelle, is going to be doing our tagline in her gorgeous French accent. <laughs> and I know you guys are going to enjoy it. So we'll wrap it up a little bit lighter for you. Um, yeah. So if you like what you hear, come find us on social media. Tell your friends about us. And... We have a Patreon. If you want more of us, you can come do that for $3 a month and be an official closet sister. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you next week for a brand new episode. And always remember, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet. And don't forget, the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet. <laughs>